give thee a word is true and real. We ask you to look over as uh, you know our hearts and our minds. God, you know the things that we need more than anything else, God. Teach us and show us exactly what in our lives need to be changed, God, because that's why we came here. So we're not going to be surprised when you ask us to change, God, because this is why we came here, to be changed. And God, for me, who always refuses the change, God, who always thinks that you're talking to somebody else, God, to me, God, speak. I want to change, God. I want to be more like you every, every single day. I declare, as the psalm writer did, that I will not be satisfied until I awake in your likeness. Help us, God. Be with us and show us there is more than hope in you. More than hope. In Christ Jesus and for your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 5 of the book of 1 Timothy is very interesting. As we continue through the pastoral epistles that are um, the book of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, we know that these were instructions to the church. These were a young pastor in a town starting a church, and he was so distraught. He was so confused because like so many, you get into ministry and you think, wow, I've reached the pinnacle. I'm a pastor. I'm a minister. And then you find out, wow, this is hard work. Wow, there's more to this than just preaching God's word. Come on, bring all them kitties in here now. Hi, Felice. How are you? You get them seats and Bibles, please, guys? That's okay. They can come in here. We don't mind that. They'll have fun. Soon, soon they're not going to want to come in here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Where's King? Oh, there he is. So, as a young pastor, as a very young pastor myself, <laughs> thank you for not laughing at that. When I read this thing, I realize a few things. I realize how far some churches have come from the instruction of God's Word. And realizing that even though the hard way is not always the wrong way. But to understand that the things that are taught here are the things that will be applied at our church. And despite some people's feelings, some people's thoughts, we will do our very best to accomplish the things taught here. Because again, going through Scripture, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, it isn't always cool stories about what the Lord did. He walked on water and we could make up. Sometimes it's just plain instruction. And this is what today is. To understand how a church works. And that also gives you the opportunity, should you decide to go to another church at some point and something happens, and you go, hey, you know, that's not like what was taught at that church. In this. You want to make sure that the church you go to is as biblical as possible. Because no church should ever stray from God's Word. Amen. You with me? Amen. Agreed? Amen. With that thought in mind, the instruction to Paul, uh, from Paul to Timothy, the young pastor, he says to him, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. He says, you know, you're going to get some men in the church who can be a little bit unruly. Some guys who aren't really walking the walk. They like to talk the talk. He says, but I want you to remember something. If you're dealing with an older brother, never rebuke him harshly. Why? He didn't write why. Sometimes you don't have to know why. Are you one of those why people? Why, God? Sometimes he gives us the whys, and sometimes he just says, because I said so. Amen. You ever say that to your kids? Because I said so. <laughs> and sometimes it's as simple as, my, my, my four-year-old, she wants to stick the metal knife into that little cute socket on the thing there. I said, don't do that. Why? Because I said so, okay? How do you describe to them a shock, you know? Well, because this little thing that you can't see is going to touch the end of that. It's going to go to that, and you're going to go like this, and you're going to fall down, and could really be bad. Why? That's what you'll get. Paul instructing Timothy, says, don't rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. I love this. I love this. Anybody here that is a young man struggling with their purity, like almost all of us are, will find it so much easier once you have daughters. One time, 
Now this might sound a little on the sick side, but stay with me, you'll get it at the end. My young daughter, I'm not going to tell you which one, was climbing up a ladder, helping me fix something on the roof. And her shorts were very loose, and I was holding the ladder, and as her shorts opened up and she had underwear, and I was like, oh, my daughter's underwear, that's just nasty! <laughs> Well, of course, you guys think, well, of course. Yes, but us same guys, we'll see a woman stand up that we don't know, and we'll see something in her back, and we'll be like, whoa, didn't see that. <laughs> We're driving by the car, and your car's a little higher, and you're like, hmm. Now here, the Lord says, I'll give you a, a, a little trick for you. You want to stay pure? Look at your younger sisters as daughters. Now, some of you guys that are new to our church are thinking, Wow, you guys are all sick here. Yes, we're as sick as you. Because nobody struggles with sexuality here, right? Ladies never lost, I forgot, I'm sorry. And men, we never look at things we shouldn't. I got it now, I got it. But placate us sickos. Just make believe for a minute you're a part of us. Talk to younger men as your young, as your young brothers. You know sometimes certain people can just aggravate you? And especially the younger, smaller brothers, and you just want to just give them a little... He says, you know what, don't do that. He says, look at him as your little brother. Even though you don't like him, because you find somebody has a personality that you might not like, that a little different, you might find out that the root of that might be something you didn't expect. That their father might have been abusive, their mother, they might not have a father. So look at them as your little brother and see how you can bless them. I love the rules that he gives here. Simple, easy to follow, direct. Younger sisters, younger women as sisters, with all pure... Older, older women as mothers. You ain't going to lust after an older woman anymore if you can do that, right? <laughs> Verse 3. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn, learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. Listen, let me explain to you. That word for honor there, that first word in verse 3, it's a financial word. The job of the church was to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. Now, from a financial perspective, again, sticking with Scripture, understand this. The church has failed miserably. We don't have the money to take care of. Our government has now had to do what the church is not only unwilling to do, but cannot do because the people aren't tithing well. In the book of Malachi, in chapter 3, it says, hey, take 10% of everything you make and bring it to the storehouse, the church, so that way there will be food enough for all. Because it was assumed that everybody's going to go to church because everybody would be needy. But now, the people of our country especially are suckling and nursing on the breast that is the government. Thus, taking everything that the government has in the way of resources that it should be using for something else, what the church should have been doing itself. You with me? If the church actually tithed 10%, do you know as many people that go to church in our country, we could pay off the national debt and we could take care of our country instead of asking the country to take care of us? Amen. It's kind of a weird thing. We ask the country to give us tax-free status. You know what? We shouldn't need tax-free status. I'll pay the taxes. I have no problem with that. If the people were tithing, not only could we pay our taxes, we could pay the government's problems too. Let us take care of the widows. Didn't mean to use this as a soapbox time, but this is what he says. He says, listen here. The way this church thing was set up, honor widows who are really widows. Let me give you, now that word for widows there, that doesn't just mean a woman whose husband has passed. That could also just mean a single mom. It could mean a woman who is alone, whose maybe family has, she's moved here and she's alone. Now what we do as a church, taking that very seriously, if there's a woman here, who we first, the first thing we look for is the widows, the single moms, and we say, what's your needs? Right now we have a, a, a couple of families in the church that need um, um, furniture. So if anybody here has got some extra furniture sitting in the warehouse they want to get rid of, come and see me afterward. I'll tell you what, we've got this family that needs furniture. Single mom with a, with a few kids. You come here and you might be a brother. And you might come to me and you might say, hey, we really have needs. Uh, I can't pay my rent this month. And I go, you know. 
there's no money in the, to in the, in the tithe box to help you because you're a man. What? That, this is supposed to be a church. Listen to me. We are exhorted in scripture to first help the single moms. Well, don't you have a benevolence fund? Yes, we do. And it's got a lot of money in it. But I cannot use the funds of the church as an elders board and a pastors and deacons. When we get together and we talk about the needs of the church, the first thing, single moms, widows. Why? Because this is what it says right here. And we have to stick to Scripture. The Bible tells men, if you don't work, you don't eat. Well, I can't find a job. You can't find a job, I can put you to work. I can get you a few days work here. We have plenty that needs to be done here. You really have no problem? We have a few guys here that own businesses, and they always need somebody. Well, I don't like working outside. Anything else? Well, I can't be on the books, because I don't want to lose my unemployment. Anything else? I don't have work boots. Anything else? I'm just going to sit at home and pray for a job. You do that. See how that works for you. And then you actually find out why. And then we don't rebuke them harshly, but we come alongside them. Now listen to me. Here's what the Word of God says. Here's how. This is how it works. You want to work? You want to eat? We'll give you some money to work, though. You understand? Sticking to Scripture, helping people. Because listen to me, God knows the heart of man. God knows the heart of women. All these things that he wrote here, he didn't write them down because that was his preference. He wrote it down because he knows the heart of man. He knows what's in it. If you give a man money, if you give up any family money without having them earn it, they don't know the value of money. One of the things I was guilty of with my children, I so desire never to have my children have it as hard as me. Uh, any, any, fa any father ever say that? I don't want my kids to have it as hard as me. Of course. So we spoil them. And then they grow up not having a value of money. And then we look at, and we look and they turn 11, 12. Get me this. Buy me that. Do me this. Like, you got to earn it, son. You got to earn it, daughter. I gave my daughter Cammie. She lost her tooth. So we took the little pillow. We have a little pillow that has a little pocket in it. So I took the little pillow, opened the pocket, put her tooth in it, and we put it near the bed. And when she was sleeping, I crept in there, took the tooth out, I folded up a couple of singles, put it in there, put it on the bed. Then I took some powder and some sparkles, and I mixed them together, and I put it all over the bed and down the rooms and made like the tooth fairy was in there. She woke up, she was like, ah! She's, she's picking up the sparkles and she's putting it all over herself. I'm going to fly, Daddy! <laughs> it's a di different fairy. Di different fairy. Like maybe that wasn't such a good idea. I got two dollars! Can I buy a piece of candy? You can buy a bunch of candy. Can I buy a car? Can't buy a car. I found one of the dollars in the house. I just took it and put it in my pocket. She didn't know. She had no value of money. She had six dollars. I did. I did. I'm confessed. I stole her money, okay? It's my money. I just stole it back. She left it on the table. You leave it around, I'm picking it up. That's just the way it is. Now's the time to teach them. That was a great, that's a great family trip to take them to the store and, and show them the different candy. This is cost such and such dollars. It, yeah, it takes time. Yeah, it takes effort. So worth it. So we don't wind up with the messes that we have. Verse, um, go to verse 3 again. Honor widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Let me tell you what, what the Word of God is saying there. A single mom comes here. A single woman comes here. And we talk to her, and she says she has needs, and, and we say, hey, where's your folks at? Oh, well, my parents live in, and they tell you, you know, what city, what state. Say, so, have you gone to them for help yet? Why? Well, it could be, and here's, I think, what the intimation here is. She's in rebellion. She's gone away from God. Her family, usually, this is, and this is usually, they... Her family loves the Lord. She's in rebellion from them. She comes here. She doesn't know where else to go. She comes to church because there's something in her heart that tells her God can help. She comes here, and if we now enable her 
or enable him instead of helping them to be broken, the worst thing you can do is give money to somebody who God has taken everything from. Do you understand that? God looks and says, look, I finally got that person to where I want. I finally closed every door to get to their heart, but don't worry, you come along or we come along as a church, we just throw money at them and now they don't need God. Why? They don't need God because they got us. Well, they, And they don't correlate us from God. They just figured we're nice people here. That's the church where they give money. Church I used to go to had that. They had a million dollar benevolence fund and every single person they'd give something to. And, and before, as my, one of the pastoral um, preparations that I had was being in that ministry and I started turning people down. No, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you money. I can't because I tithe to this church and I'm not going to give my church a specific environment that the Bible says not to do it to. So now I run my church like that. Verse 5. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. A, Woody, a widow who is really a widow. Somebody who is truly broken for the Lord. Somebody who is truly is just coming to church. They're not asking for nothing. They're just coming to church and they're trusting that God is going to do something. And here's what happens in the normal course of fellowship. You talk to another woman at the church, they find out you have needs. That woman goes to another woman at the church, find, then eventually it gets back to the elders of the, and say, hey, do you know so-and-so? Yes. They're really hurting. Really, I didn't know that. Now, if you come here because you have needs, that's just as good. I'm not saying don't come to us immediately. But here's how Paul, telling Timothy, it's supposed to go down. A woman who is really just broken by the Lord because they had a wayward husband or their husband passed or they made some bad choices, but they're broken for the Lord. She's just going to continue in prayer. Listen, again, but he who lives... Who continue, uh, he who trusts in God continues in supplication and prayers night and day, believing God's going to help, believing God's going to do something. And then we become the hands of God instead of the crutch from God. Are you all with me? Amen. Continuing. But she who lives in pleasure is dead when she lives. Now here's what happens. A lot of moms, they live a wayward life as a young teenager. They have a kid early or, or they're rebellious. It says, that's not the woman that you help while she's partying. Don't help them while they're partying. Wait for them partying to be done. Because while they're living, they come here and they go to church here on Sunday because they think as long as they go to church here, they sing a couple of songs, they hear a sermon, they're okay. But they're living like, like vamps out there. They're sleeping around on the weekend. They're doing the, He says, that woman needs brokenness first. She needs to realize that sex is not her satisfier. She needs to understand that a relationship with a man, the best relationship she can have with a man is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what he, uh, Paul is instructing here. And then verse 7, these things command that they may be blameless. They may be blameless. Here Paul says to, to Timothy, listen, if you help people think they're okay with God when they're not, you're sending them to hell. You can't make somebody think they're okay with God when they're not okay with God. You make sure, I command you to command these things to people. Some people come here all the time and, why are you always talking about sin? Why are you always talking? Listen to me. It ain't me. It's where we are in the Word. I don't have a pet project. I'm just teaching what the Bible says. And if that's hitting you in a place, please understand, it ain't me that's doing it. It's the Lord. Maybe it's time to just say, you know what, God? I'm going to do this. Maybe. Verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially those for his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, going to the parents of the thing, you, you as a church, and we've had this as, as before, we call the parents of the, of the young lady or the family sister and say, you know, your kids are really in need. Well, they ran away. Whatever. Listen to me. If you're a brother in the Lord, if you're a sister in the Lord, the Bible specifically says, don't make them a burden of the church. There's true widows. There's true families in need. Your job as a mom and dad, your job as a brother is to take care of them. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to buy them a house. But for me, because, um, because God has so blessed me as a, as, a, as, a, as a working man for the last 30 years, I've, I've done... Um, 
I've done certain things for my family. I, I'll, I'll pay my mother's phone bill for a year. I'll pay my cousin's electric bill for a few months. I, I help in a way that doesn't enable, yet still assists, and try to always give the glory to God. You know what I'm saying? If it's your family, do something. Keep a line of communication open. When I paid my mother's phone bill, for, for five or six years, I, she just had a cell phone. And I just, even when we weren't speaking, even when we were fighting, I still paid the bill. I never held that bill against her. I wanted her to have nothing to say. Now, I know I'm probably the only family that's ever had this. You know how families chat? I know not your family, just maybe my family. Right? And what happened is, oh, my son, he's too busy with his church. Oh, my son, he's too busy with his, his jujitsu. He said, and then my family goes, you know, I talked to your mom and she said, and I said, did she tell you we pay her phone bill, her electric bill, and her rent the last three months? Oh, she didn't say that? Oh, sorry. Did, you, did, you, did she tell you I told her that she can leave that apartment that she's paying $1,500 a month for and come and stay with us anytime? Oh, she didn't tell you that? Oh, so sorry. So how about an idea? Do you mind your own business? Get your facts straight. Now, I know that only happens in my family, not in your family. I know. I'm really messed up though and you guys are all cool. So he says, but for you guys that have family that's out there, he says, as a Christian, do something. Reach out. He says, because if you don't take care of your own, if you don't honor, again, that's the, that's, that word honor is a financial. If you don't honor them, then you're worse than an unbeliever. Unbelievers don't do, even do better than that. You follow what I'm saying? Now, listen, there is a time to cut them off, and I'm using this as a caveat. There is a time to say, you know what? Every time I give you money, every time I do this for you, you take advantage, it doesn't mean that you're to go broke helping them. It just means just to continue helping them. Find a way to bless them. You follow what I'm saying? This is what he's talking about. Verse 9. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man. Well reported for good works if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she, has really, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. Let me explain to you what is here. So far we've come. In the old days when the church was actually the church, the churches existed from house to house. They didn't necessarily have a building. And people who had houses, they did crazy things. There was a widow in the church, a true widow, a woman who is in her 60s or later, whose husband had passed, who'd raised kids, maybe their kids. Somebody from the church would take them in. The church itself would take them in and pay for everything they need. But what happened was, even back then, 2,000 years ago, women would come and say, oh, I'm a widow, I need to stay somewhere. Somebody would take them in, they would live in wantonness. They would live their own life. And he says, listen, don't fall for that. Women can be, and again, this is no, I'm just saying, what, women can be sneaky. They can be tricky. They can come here and they can tell you everything's great. They can tell you they're fine. But on the weekend, they're out partying. On the weekdays, they're out gossiping, busybodying, doing their thing. you got to be careful. He says, here's the rule. Make sure if you're taking widows in, if you're going to take care of them, make sure they're 60 or over. Make sure they've been good women. Because you can't take somebody in if they're not first broken for the Lord. Because then again, you're a crutch before God, enabling them to live the life that they want instead of helping them to find God. Are you with me? Continuing the instruction. Verse 11, But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they cast off their first faith. He says this, exactly what I'm talking about. You got a single woman, you have a widow, you have a woman who's alone, don't take her in. Let her find herself a man. Help her, but don't let her live in one of the houses enabling her. Because the desires that she has, sexual in nature, are good desires. It's not bad, but you can't have that happen so that she becomes a... You know what I'm talking about. One of those. Verse 13, and besides, if you do and they don't grow, so if they don't grow wanton, if they don't become, you know, lusty because they, they're, they're missing out their men and their best part of their lives and whatever excuses men and women give themselves for why they do this, he says this, they'll learn to be idle. 
wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies saying things they, which they ought not. He says, so if they don't go one way, what happens is then they sit around doing nothing because they have nothing to do because they don't have to work, they don't have to take care of kids. So what they do is they wind up going from house. Remember I showed that the churches were, and then they just, oh, you know what happened? I was staying with so-and-so last week, and they said this, and they did this, and I heard they got into a bit. He says, don't let that happen. This is why you don't take them in. He actually gives the reason why you don't do that. And this is something we have absolutely applied to our church. And some people have left not appreciating the way that we tried to be biblical. And that's okay too. That's okay too. Staying with me, verse 14. Therefore I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity for the adversary to speak reproachfully. Give me your attention. This is a very important thing that I don't want you to miss here. A couple of weeks ago, remember we looked at where Paul told the women to stay silent in church? And some of the women were just like, I can't believe submission stays out. Listen what he says here though. The same guy that wrote that, look what he wrote. See what he said? Manage the house. Not such a bad job, ladies. Here he didn't, Paul didn't say you're an idiot and you got nothing good to say. He just said, here's the job that I can assign to you that is greater than becoming some uh, executive at some company. Manage your house, man. Take care of your kids. Make sure your husband can go out every day and work. Let me tell you, my wife used to do something. She hasn't done it in a while, but I used to love when she did it. I used to leave, and she used to go at the door like this. <laughs> go get him, honey. Go get him. She knew I was going out into the world. She knew I was going to go out there and try to shake money from the trees. Go get him, baby. Go get him. You can do it. You can do it. I was like, that's a little on the corny side, honey. <laughs> We learned it at a marriage. We went to a marriage conference together and they said do it. So she did it. And I used to come home and she used to, how'd it go, baby? Sit down, relax, have your fifth. Because, you know, how many of you guys know, you, you, you get up in the morning, you, you do your devotion, and you're in, you're in Jesus' head. Then you go out into the world, and man, it just, the world just bang, 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 beat you up. And, and some of you guys that are real busy at work, and, and you're working, and, 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 and you're trying not to look, and trying not to think, and, and then you get into an argument with your boss, and I'm one of your fellow workers, and then, and then you get in your car, and you're driving home, and you're thinking about the day, and you get home, and your wife says, put the kids to bed. And you're like, put the kids to bed, how about if I put you to bed? How about that? <laughs> Ladies, understand, give, give the man 15 minutes. Well, men, if your wife's working, give, give, give them a few minutes. Let them, let them get used. They're home now. Let, let, let the world wash out of them for a second. You know, a big glass of water, soda, wine, whatever it is that you prefer. Give them 15 minutes. You follow me? Amen. Amen on that one or what? Men, am I right? Working ladies, am I right? Manage the house, give no opportunity for the adversary to speak reproachfully. Verse 15, for some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. That's exactly what I was talking about. He says, if you have a sister, if you have a mother, if you have a, if they're really widows, you take care of them. Don't make the church take care of them. <coughs> Don't make the church take care of them. The church should have enough burdens. You have to stay with them. Are you with me? Verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Again, that word for honor there is finances. He says this. If you have elders of the church, if you have pastors of the church, and they're teaching God's word, training people up in doctrine, he said, don't make them work outside so hard that they have nothing left when they come here. Now, remember this. This is also the same Paul that told the church in Ephesus, when I came to you, I didn't ask you for any money. I make my own money. That's how I am now. I come to you guys, and as a pastor, I own my own business. I don't need no money from the church. The church gives me what's called a monthly stipend. It helps me pay my mortgage. But other than that, I don't need anything. 
I don't need anything. So I don't take a salary. I don't need a check. However, there are some that do. We find some pastors in our church who need a little something. We take care of a worship leader. We help her out a little bit because she's so hard at work and, and she does not make the money. To, so we take care of them. We take care of Austin and Elena. Just a little bit. Just a little to help them out a little bit. He says, because you let those who are doing that, they're worthy of double honor. Give them the chance to have a little bit more freedom. Imagine if I didn't have money and I didn't want to, and I was so prideful. Now what happened with me was the first three years of the church, I made a promise to God, I'm not going to take any money for the first three years. Now that was about the time that the housing market blew. That was about the time we had all those hurricanes five, six years ago, remember? So about two and a half years in, I sat down with my board and my board consisted of uh, a couple of other pastors from other churches and they said, look dude, you're going backwards. You're going backwards. Every month, you're losing money. Your savings are gone. Your insurance, gone. You have nothing left. You're moving backwards. If you don't start taking money, and I said, yeah, but I made a promise to God I wasn't going to take no money for, for at least three years. And they said, then you need to get another board because you can't. According to scripture, it says it's, so that's when I first started letting the church give me, now as God has restored, I've, we've taken less and less and less from the church because the widows need it. This building costs money. We don't have millions of dollars in the bank. We appreciate all the faithful tithers, but every month, you know, Julia who does our books, how are we looking? Can we send a rent check out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The third, the fifth, the seventh. The Sometimes it's not the middle of the month. And the landlord, praise God, he's been great. Don't worry, I know how churches work. Just send the money out when you get it. So we're not hurting. I mean, it was no problem that we could take a thousand bucks and, and get a bunch of backpacks. That, praise God for that. And a bunch of people. But do you understand? He says, if you have your own widows, don't burden the church. <coughs> Let the church take care of those that are truly widows or single moms or sisters who just need a leg up. Are you understanding? Now again, please, I know this isn't the most exciting of scriptures and I'm not describing and, and, and going through the desert with you. It's okay. Sometimes it ain't like that. Sometimes it's just instruction. That's the great thing about scripture. Continuing. And he explains why. For the scripture says, says, you shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So now Paul, invoking the Old Testament, says you don't muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. And here's what that is an allegory of. There's a picture of. It says, when you are treading grain out with, a, with an ox, the ox would run, you'd have the yoke on him, and you'd go out, and he'd be stomping and pulling over the grain, breaking up the wheat. He says, don't put a muzzle on the ox, because while the ox is treading out the grain. If he wants to reach down and grab a mouthful for a little nourishment, for a little energy, let him do it. Let him do it. Don't muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. Let the ox have something to eat. Same thing. Let him have something to eat. We're not, we're not raping the church, I promise. It's a little something, something just to keep you all going. You know, you know what I'm saying? Amen. I hope so. Amen. And then he says, the laborer is worthy of his wage. You know, do not receive an accusation against an elder except for two or three witnesses. Very interesting scripture. A lot of times people will come and say, you know, I saw so and so doing such and such. Now, I know this might even be hard for you guys to believe and I'm going to use myself as an example and I, I only do that as a testimony never to bring any picture to myself. But early in the church, there was a couple of women who, um, believe it or not, they weren't big Pastor Ryan fans. So they wrote a letter to Pastor Bob, who used to be my senior pastor, saying all these things that I was doing wrong. And he called me up about five or six months after he got the letter, and he was talking about something. He says, you know, there was something else I wanted to talk to you about. And I said, well, what is it? He says, I got a letter from, and he told me their names, and I'm like, what did they send you a letter about? Well... He asked me, and I'm just going to be flat on it, he says, you keeping your pants on, Ryan? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, I'm just asking you. And I said, yeah, I'm keeping my pants on when they need to be on. <laughs> he said, okay. He said, then I'm not going to entertain anymore because the Bible specifically says, unless there's two or three witnesses, don't entertain the accusation. And I was like, wow. I thought about it, man. If this guy was rushing to judgment without following the Bible, could have sunk our church. I mean, accusation was brought against me that I was literally having an affair. 
That wasn't true. Believe me, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be speaking a lot higher. My wife would never, ever deal with that. <laughs> Believe me. Neither would my kids. My girls. <laughs> and that's what happens. Sometimes people with... Uh, with evil intention, they'll bring an accusation against one of our pastors, one of our elders. You know, Austin did. And I'll ignore it until there's two or three. Now, don't get me wrong, I won't completely ignore it. I'll kind of jot it down and make sure if it's becoming a pattern thing. But if somebody says something about one of our sisters that are in ministry here, you go to pick up your kid and you had a bad day and the Lord convicted you, you come back and say, you know, when I went to pick up the kid, the, the person back there was mean. Like, how oh, they were only taking care of 15 kids and yours was one of them. I don't know why they'd be upset. But it's a pattern that has happened where I had some people who were actually, and I had to sit one particular woman down and say, you know, to serve God is a joy and a privilege. If it's a burden, then we have done you wrong by making you serve instead of allowing you to serve. If you feel the calling of the Lord upon you to serve in the children's ministry, it's a huge calling. For greater what they're doing in there mostly than what we're doing in here even. But if it becomes something, oh my goodness, it's the third weekend of the month, it's my turn to serve those kids and those people that come pick up the kid, not one of them, thank you so much. What are you doing? This is supposed to be for God. This isn't for you. And sometimes we've had to do that. But again, I love the fact that Scripture says, don't entertain the accusation unless it's two or three witnesses. Safety in numbers. Continuing. Again, just the instructions on how to run a church. Verse 20. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Very important instruction. We had a man who was a part of our church who was in a sin. He was in a gossip sin. And he couldn't control his heart and his mouth from uttering ill against even the people of our church. So we called what we, what we did is we called what we labeled a family meeting. Hey, after church, we're having a family meeting. If you consider Calvary Chapel, Liver Beach to be a part of your church home, please come on out. I gave the man the opportunity to be here and confess. Since he chose not that opportunity, I told about the 30 or 40 people I showed up what this man was doing in the church and why. Because what happens is, you all see the outside, you meet a dude, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. How are you? Nice to see you. Hey, how's it going? Okay, great. Hey, yeah, how's it going? Yeah. And you think, wow, what a great guy he is. And you don't realize, well, that great guy, man, he's a nasty gossip. That great guy is causing a lot of problems. But he's so talented. He's so gifted. And he's so good looking. But he's hurting the church. So we rebuked him in the presence of all. That others may see. You'll get the same treatment. If you're in leadership in this, if you're in ministry at this church, and we catch you in a sin, we'll give you the chance to come up and confess to the family of... If you don't, we'll tell everybody that everybody would know. We'd rather you leave with your sin, go someplace else, than keep it here. We ain't going to have it. I got too many people. I got single sisters here that are hurting, and I'm not going to let a man take advantage of them. I got single brothers here that are trying to stay pure, and I'm not going to let a sister take advantage of them. Can't do it. We have to help everybody. We have to help each other. You know, we looked at it the other day about dressing modestly. Same situation we're talking about. Ladies, sometimes, give us a break. So we're just men. We're just men, you know, flesh and blood. Help us out here. You know? We don't want, we don't want, uh, you know, I've had, I've had sisters, you know, that dude was checking me out. You know, I come to church here, I don't, I don't. Look, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but, you know, maybe if you put the goodies away, maybe they wouldn't check them out. <laughs> hey, if that sounds crass, I'm sorry. I'm not intending to be crass, but help us out. We're just men. We are flesh and blood. I know it's the church, and you think that we're all supposed to walk around holy, and we're doing our best. Believe me, we try, but sometimes it's like, Great googly moogly sister, cut us some slack. 
A few brothers here that think that's kind of nasty or something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Not you. At least not here. And I love, uh, look at verse 21. He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Now, I don't know what the elect angels are, but I know who God and Jesus Christ is. Paul is what's called tightening the screws. Listen, he says, this isn't good suggestions. I'm not joking. I'm, not t I'm telling you, before God, before the Lord and the angels, in case you think you're going to get away from God and, and, and Jesus, you're not going to get away from the angels. <laughs> He says, I tell you before them all that you observe these things without prejudice. Do nothing with partiality. Most important thing he says, he says, do not be a respecter of persons. I don't care if the person ties a ton of money to the church. I don't care if he's one of your best friends from the gym. I don't care if he's your brother-in-law, sister-in-law. You keep these things without prejudice. And without, partia without partiality. Now listen at verse 22. He says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Now there's a dual meaning here. When you lay hands on somebody, like I've told you, if our church gets too big, if we, have, if, if we keep getting big crowds, what we're going to do is we're going to take somebody from the church, one of our elders, one of our, one of our deacons, maybe Ryan, maybe, and we're going to say, you know what? Let's take 20, 25 people and let's start another one up the block. We don't want to go to two services. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to do that whole thing. We want to always stay this family environment we have. So if we have to do that, what we're going to do is, now Mike, who's just recently come to the Lord, and he's got a great personality, he's got a great design. Let's bring him out, let's lay hands on him and send him out. He goes, don't do that. Let him get a little more seasoning. Let him learn the word of God more. Let, let that happen. Don't be hastily into doing that. You follow? But the other side is don't share in other sins. And what he meant by that, according to most of what I read, was when you're restoring somebody, don't be hastily either. As a pastor, I've had other pastor friends that have fallen into sin and they come here for restoration and they're here for two or three months and we want, oh, because we'd like him there too, but he's such a good friend of mine and man, I want to see him restored, so let's, let's, let's restore him quickly. Come on, five, six months. Let's, let's lay hands on him, send him out, start, go back to his church. He said he's sorry. He said he's sorry. Paul said, don't do that. Don't share in their sin because here's what happens. Somebody comes here. They come here for restoration and I send them out too early. I I've just shared in their sin if they screw up again. And we've had that happen a couple of times. Pastors, they say, oh, Ryan, I want to, you know, I want to have what you have. I want to be that passion. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. Um, you come and they serve under me for two or three months and they realize, you suck, dude. <laughs> You're horrible. Yes, I do. I, I, did you think you were coming here for? You came here for this. This is what we do. Discipline. This is how we keep ourselves in check. Yeah. Well, I ain't going to be here that. Bye. <laughs> I'm not sharing in your sin. And then this one particular one that I'm thinking, he went to another church. That dude put him right in ministry. And I called him up. I'm like, are you serious? Did you even call me and ask me what was going on? Well, everybody knows who, how you are. How am I? <laughs> Do tell. You mean I stick to scripture? <laughs> Woe is me. So you just shared in their sin. What? The Bible says you just shared in their sin. Now that pastor fell again. And that person that put him in ministry shared in, their, shared in his sin. So here the exhortation from Paul to Timothy. Don't share in their sin, nor send them out too fast. Make sure this job's hard enough. Go back to, go back to verse 1. This ain't easy, guys. Before you get in ministry, before you decide you want to be in ministry, listen to me. I've told men this all the time. I speak at, at conferences where they're young pastors. And here's what I tell them. 10% of what you do is preaching. 10%. Do you think this is the job? This is the cake. This is the cotton candy. I woke up at 6 o'clock this morning. I was like, this is the day. Tomorrow when I get the phone calls, did you say this? Did you say that? Did you hear this? Did you go to the hospital? This one's got cancer. That one's got this. Can you go lay hands on this? Oh my goodness. The carrying that I do. The single sister who's broken hearted. The bro you kidding me? The marriage that's on the edge of divorce because the kid's on crack. You think this is easy? I tell you, you better be praying hard if you want to get into the ministry. 10% of what I do is this, and this is the fun part. 
If you don't think I'm that good at it, I don't really care. I'm not really trying to be good at being a preacher. I'm trying to be better at being a pastor. I want to lead you guys. I want to keep myself pure. I want me and me and my family to be an example of how to do things through trials and, and through the good times and the bad. Continuing, and here's where we finish. Verse 23, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. <laughs> he says, yeah, I know these people are crazy. Drink a little wine and make you feel better. <laughs> now, we talked about it last week that some thought that he was actually an athlete. Some people thought that Timothy was an athlete because he used so many metaphors with him, so many physical metaphors. Even last week he said, that, you know, he talked about how bodily exercise profits a little. So, so Timothy's an athlete. So all of a sudden he's got a bad stomach. Yeah, I know ministry will do that to you. <laughs> so drink a little wine and make your stomach feel better. Now, this is not an exhortation if you have an alcohol problem here. This is not God saying it's okay to drink alcohol. Now, I will tell you this, and stay with me. I drink as much alcohol as I want. I drink as much beer and as much wine as I want. You ask me how many times in the last 20 years I've drinking beer or wine. Zero. It's not my thing. Never liked it, never did. My wife, every once in a while, she likes a little glass of Zinfandel if we go out. Knock yourself out, but not for drinking, not for drunkenness. You with me? This was medicinal. He was given to him medicinally. If you struggle with alcohol or you come from an alcohol background and, and now you've been walking with the Lord for a few years and you think, well, I can have a glass of wine. I don't know if I would do that. Well, you just read it. Can, nah, there's other medicine that you might want to do before you go into that. Ask anybody who's a recovering drug addict who's been recovering for more than 10 years and fell back into it, and they go, I don't know how it happened. I thought I was strong. I thought I could handle it. I never... Th you guys, anybody amen that? Just... And then lastly, he tells them why. Here he sums up the whole chapter in this last verse, 24. He says, Because some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, and those of some follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. He goes, Because you never know who's going to make it and who's not. You never know who's in a gross, negligent sin. You never know who's like the most servant in the world. I love, used to love it. I heard a pastor one time preach, and he said, This is great. When you get to heaven... Those that serve faithfully will have the biggest mansion. Because that's what scripture says. So you get to heaven and you think, well, there's going to be Billy Graham's mansion. There's going to be Pastor Bob's. You, you think about all the pastors. You, and you say, no, that's uh, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown? I don't know who Mrs. Brown. She sat in her church and prayed for a pastor faithfully for 30 some odd years and never asked for nothing. What? I didn't even know her. Yeah, exactly. She didn't get her reward here on earth, so she got it in heaven. So you just never know who the servant is. You just never know. You look at the personality. You look at the people. He says, you never know. Some men's sins, they're clearly evident. My wife always says to me, Ryan, that's what's hardest about you. He says, you wear everything right here. You know everything about you. You meet here in five minutes. You know everything there is to know about you seemingly. My sins, they're right here. Some men's sins... They follow later. And the guy who you thought was the greatest, most talented, greatest singer, great guitar player, you find out later on, really? That dude was doing that? Yeah, that dude was doing that. You just didn't even know it, did you? No, I, I wouldn't have expected that. It's okay. The Bible tells you some men's sins, they're clearly evident. Some follow later, and it leads them right into judgment. Their sin dragged them right into hell. But those that have others follow even later. But it's the same way with good works. Some people, you see them at the church, hey, and they're mopping, hey, how's it going? Clean up the church. Do you know there's a family that comes here every Saturday and they clean the church up? And they don't ask for nothing. They don't, wouldn't take anything I gave it to them. Drop off the keys. Here's the list of needs. Blessed, blessed family. And God is watching over and protecting them. And every time they come and do that, God's like, I got this one. He writes them a check. And it's not a check that, 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 that bounces. It's a check that goes to heaven where nobody can touch it. No moth can eat it. No rust can destroy it. Yeah. And especially those people that have taken care of our kids. My kids are over there. You all that might not know me, I got six kids. Two of them are over there. And, and your family, they're sacrificing their time, their service, and they're over there doing that. So when you go pick up your kids... And remember what they've been doing. They've been taking care of your kids. Your kids. My kids. Whew. Close your Bible. If you have any questions about this stuff, you want to bring to remind, remembrance anything that maybe we didn't do that you think we should have at a time, please do so. 
Because the best thing you can do is if you feel somebody's wronged you or done you wrong, is just go talk to them. Mm-hmm. According to Matthew chapter 18, just go talk to them one-on-one. You might find out things might be a little different than you thought, or maybe you could help the church. I mean, don't you want to help your church? It's not like we got so many people. Like, Come talk to us. We got this. You know what I'm saying? 